it's all day Tuesday. Tuesday all day today. It's the 27th of May, 2K14. This is Wayne Goldsboro Television. And I'm really happy you're with us. My name is Wayne Alley. And I'm Kim Best. Good morning. Good morning. Oh my goodness, May is almost over, Wayne. Oh, can you believe that? I know that. I really cannot. June 1st, and this is, this is, this is just something for you to keep in the back of your mind. Okay, thank you. Is the beginning of hurricane season. Okay, so just kind of keep that, plant that in the back of the noggin there. Okay, we've planted. Just keep that in mind. And we're going to be doing some programming on that as well. Some, some things you need to be doing to be aware of during hurricane season. Just in case the need arises. Right, oops. Better to be prepared. <laughs> or you're dropping stuff all over the place. I know. On today's program, do we have that or yes, did you we, drop that? <laughs> well, I did drop it, but I remember who's uh, on. Oh. We have part one of the baseball presentation that was made at Wayne County Public Library. Tell us more about that, Wayne. Well, Marty Cheddar is absolutely amazing. He put together some of the most unbelievable programs of baseball stars, and I mean stars. Are they all in the Hall of Fame? Well, they're not all in the Hall of Fame. Some of them are okay. from Wayne County. Uh, uh, just un an unbelievable group. Uh, a lot of people remember Johnny Peacock. Uh, his, uh, his son was, uh, was there, made a presentation, talked about his dad. Uh, John Peacock talked about uh, uh, Clyde King. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there was just so many. Uh, uh, there was, I think, maybe six or eight wow. stars of professional baseball from Wayne County. From Wayne County. That's amazing. Who grew up here, played baseball here. They have had pictures and presentations and all kinds uh -huh. of things that you'll see. Yes, and there was Coming there up. was one gentleman uh, who's who's still among uh, well and Jerry Naron, of yes, course. Yes, I knew Jerry had to be uh, a part Jerry of it. Jerry had to be a part of it. Jerry was not there. He couldn't be there. He's he's out uh, playing or coaching, but um, uh, one gentleman uh, was there who played back in the fifties, and I'm not going to give you any names, but this is a four part series. Four okay? part, wow. Four part, and this is part one. We're going to see uh, here today on the program and I think you are really going to enjoy this. Some I think you'll be stories. very impressed. It's I tell you what, I was. I was. It went on. It was I, Marty said, you know, this is probably gonna last about maybe 30, 45 minutes or so, something like that. We went for almost two hours. Oh my goodness. It was a great program. That's why it's a that's why we had to divide this thing up into four parts. But uh, I promise you you're going to enjoy this. Part one is today. Fantastic. So don't move. Stay right there. Don't stay move. stay with us. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, that's on today's program. Who else do we have? Let's what else do we see. have? Let's see. Reminding you, every Wednesday, Farmer's Market will be held out at Herman Park in the parking lot on the Herman, Herman Street side, typically from 9 o'clock in the morning to about 7 or 8 in the evening. Mm -hmm. Lots of local fre fresh produce all by local farmers. Oh, want you boy. to shop local as much as possible. Then on Saturdays, we'll offer from, I believe it's 9 until 12, mm. downtown Goldsboro at Cornerstone Commons, we'll have a farmer's market there as well. Oh yeah, that's great. And you, you keep in mind, of course, that not only are you, you you're supporting, you're supporting local farmers, which is extremely important. Right. Uh, but you're also benefiting from this because you're getting fresh veggies and fresh food. That's exactly right. Grown right here in Wayne County. It's good for you. That's it right. And is. you're supporting the local economy, which is so important. All for right, so sure. Support the farmers. Well, today is the 27th, and yesterday there was some very important birthdays. So I'm going to touch on a couple of these here okay. very quickly. Uh, I don't know how important it is, but Philip Michael Thomas was on Miami Vice. He played Tubbs. He turned 55 yesterday. And a very talented actor in his own right. Also a birthday for Hank Jr. Hank Williams, both safest, wow. turned 55 as well. A birthday today, uh, yesterday for Sally Ride, the first American female astronaut. Mm -hmm. Did a wonderful job. She's a very impressive young lady. She's 53 today. Birthday for uh, General Hospital's Jeannie Francis. I remember uh, her. Yeah, Bobcat Goldthwait. For some reason, I thought he had passed away, but he didn't. He's still alive. At, he's 52 today. Uh, birthday today for Lenny Kravitz. He's having a birthday at 50. Helena Bonham Carter is having a birthday. The actress is 48. And yesterday was James Arness's birthday, and that's one of the important ones I wanted to mention. Everybody loved Matt Dillon on television. The, star of uh, the character on yes. Gunsmoke, all right? Matt That's Dillon, right. the brother of Peter Graves, a lot of people remember from Mission Impossible. Uh, birthdays today include Lee Ann Merriweather. Lee Merriweather, have oh, a birthday. I remember her. Former Miss much. America. Yes. She's 79 today. Wow. And looking good. Birthday uh, also for Herman Wook. I can't believe this man's still going. He's 99 today. 
He was the author of the Cain Mutiny. He was the author of Winds of War, War and Remembrance, and a, and a bunch of other stuff as well. But boy, is he talented. One of my favorite authors, Herman Wouk. Uh, Ramsey Lewis is 79 today. Lee Merriweather, I mentioned 79 as well. Lou Gossett Jr., one of my favorites. Oh, yes. He's 78. Uh, birthday today mm. for Kathy Silvers. You may not know the name, but she's Phil Silvers' daughter. She was uh, uh, an actress on Happy Days. In the latter years of Happy Days, she really? played Jenny Piccolo. Oh, yeah, I remember. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. She's Phil Silver's daughter. I didn't know that. He was one of the funniest men who ever lived. Sergeant Bilko, the original. And uh, today is also the anniversary of the birth of Vincent Price, another one of my favorites. He was so talented. Uh, but he was also a writer. He wrote uh, cookbooks. Did he really? He did. He was quite the chef. Who yeah. would have known? He died uh, 11 years ago. Wow. Well, something, something like that. About 11 years. Well, this Thursday, Wayne, is Center Street Jam. That's this, this Thursday. Thursday oh, May 29th from okay. 5 until, actually, I believe it's 6 until 9. Okay. 6 until 9 p.m. Of course, it's in the John Street parking lot okay. behind the Flying Shamrock. Oh, boy. It is a fun-filled evening. The Blake Kearney Band, a local band, will mm -hmm. be the one performing for us. Lots of uh, things for family and, and uh, your kids to do. Come on out and join us 6 to 9 this Thursday, Center Street Jam. I believe at every Center Street Jam there's also something called a walk and roll. Which a is walk a walk and roll, yeah. Yes, All yes. Right. They are meeting at Cornerstone Commons, a group part of the Go Wayne Go. Yeah. And they're going to be out walking before the Center Street Jam. So we'd love to have you come and join us to walk all around downtown before you come and head on down to the Center Street Jam and enjoy a little bit of music and some refreshments. And isn't this a part of the Go Wayne Go initiative? It is. It is all, all right. a part of the Go there Wayne go. go initiative. Walk and roll. So you can go to gowaynego.org and find out more details. There you go. Gowaynego.org. I thought it was org. I believe it is org. Okay. Whatever. Gowaynego.something. <laughs> Uh, and in fact, Vincent Price died 20 years, 20 plus years ago. Uh, well, I believe it may be time to go to our our baseball interview. Time to go to baseball, yeah. That's right. Tonight we're at the Wayne County Public Library, where historian Marty Cheddar of the Public Library will be presenting a program about baseball. Baseball is very important here in Wayne County. We've had several major players go into the sport from right here in Wayne County. Tonight we're going to see artifacts. We're going to hear people talking. We're going to just have a good old time talking about baseball, the American pastime. All right, welcome, welcome tonight to, our, to the artifact spotlight for the Wayne County Baseball Heritage Project. As I've kind of mentioned, um, and some of you may have heard, who, who may have attended other events we've had, we're, we're starting to develop an ongoing archive. It will be at a look in the local history uh, to document <coughs> photographs, to really document the baseball culture, uh, which is absolutely fantastic here in Wayne County. Um, and it's just endless stories, um, and there's so many different levels and angles. So we're gonna, and we're gonna, we'll do continu continuous on, uh, projects throughout the year. A uh, secondary project that we're doing with the library is history of agriculture. In a lot of ways, they complement each other. So, um, so anyway, you can look forward to, to future events as well. Um, tonight's event is pretty special. We're going to uh, focus on sharing stories. I mean, you see names and you see uh, pictures, but we want to add a little more depth, a little more uh, uh, tell a more personal level who people were as people, as individuals, um, uh, through some rarely seen artifacts. Um, that are here in Wayne County. This isn't Raleigh, this isn't Greenville, this is Wayne County. It's some absolutely fantastic stuff. So, so I think it's going to be a pretty exciting uh, evening. Um, just in baseball in general terms, you know, to, for the, it's extreme, to get to the major league level, um, it's extremely difficult. Um, you know, when a lot of these guys started, there were only 16 teams. Um, you know, there's, uh, and if, you, if you get to the minor leagues and you get to the uh, major leagues, uh, you know, there's no guarantees. Um, you know, it's a, it's a long, grueling. It's easy. It's easy. Like when we watched the movies last week. It's easy to romanticize about it, how the, the big games, that kind of stuff. But I mean, it's a long season. It's a grueling season. Um, and a lot of times when these guys played, it was a different era too. Um, different equipment and how people worked out and stuff like that. Um, so, but that's all part of the story. We want to that document, um, and we'll tell some of those stories tonight. Um, and also, when you know, 
there's different levels. There's between minors, majors, where do you play college, the semi-pros. Um, whether, what, sorry, whether you play semi-pro baseball, um, you know, and especially when you move into more of the professional paint side, there's a, there's a lot of factors. You may get injured, you move. Uh, it's different dynamics with people, egos, competition. Um, so there's, you know, it's just, it's just we're extremely competitive and difficult to get to the major league level. Um, but everyone has a story, um, and tonight we're going to share the the uh, people, major league baseball players in Wayne County and uh, semi pro teams. So we'll start off with uh, Jet Peacock, who's the son of Johnny Peacock. Uh, thank you, Marty, and uh, welcome everyone here to the love baseball in Wayne County and in our state. I think we, before we go any further though, we all ought to give a big round of applause to Marty because we're here. He's a he has put together an array of ball, baseball facts that even I didn't know about my own ball. Uh, he, he, he's really done a great job. But uh, I'm proud to be here. I'm proud that my dad was a, a good athlete and uh, enabled him to, to get to the majors and play with the Red Sox. It, uh, he, uh, he loved it. He loved the game. Uh, and he became very dissatisfied when they, the majors first went on strike. He said, a bunch of prima donnas, they ought to go home and have to get a real job. But the owners locked the door. He was just as proud to be in, be a part of baseball in, in Boston. And Mr. Yawkey, who owned the Red Sox, was like a father to him. He, uh, baseball here on the table, is one that Lefty Grove won his 300th win. And my dad was lucky enough to kick, catch that game. And if the box scores on the, get on the ball, and uh, it's all grabbed by Lefty Grove. I wish there wasn't one in, in uh, Cooperstown because if it was, that would be worth a whole lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think Daddy, I asked him one time what was his finest moments in baseball, what he remembered the most. And he said, catching Lefty Grove, 300 win and being able to play on the same team with Jimmy Fox at first base, who's in the Hall of Fame, Bobby Doyle at second base, who's in the Hall of Fame, Joe Cronin at third base, who's in the Hall of Fame, Ted Williams in left field, who's in, Hall, in the Hall of Fame, and uh, Dom DiMaggio, Joe's brother in center field. He didn't make the Hall of Fame, but he was a good player. And he said, you know, it's, uh, he had the lowest batting average on the starting nine. My dad's lifetime average was 267, and today that would bring you millions. <laughs> it, won't, it, wouldn't, it wasn't in 1940, it, but it did. The second thing he said that was in, really meant something to him, he got a letter from a kid inviting him, telling him that he didn't have enough money, his parents didn't, to go to a baseball game, but wondered if he could come to his house for Sunday dinner. <laughs> his mom and daddy would would be glad to have him come. And daddy wrote him back and said he couldn't come because he had a baseball game. But he would love to have he and his dad come to Fenway Park to a baseball game. And uh, he met him at the clubhouse door, took him in the clubhouse, gave him balls and a bat and a glove and a hat. And they sat in daddy's uh, box seat. In 1967, Daddy got a letter. He said, and tell him I was his kid. He said, and I later became the uh, trainer for the Boston Bruins uh, hockey team and the Boston Red Sox uh, baseball team. And I'd like to invite you and your wife to come to Fenway Park in, in, as my guest in Boston. <laughs> and uh, it just, I think that shows that uh, when you you stop low enough to help a kid or uh, you never know where it'll, where it'll go from there and uh, yes i'm very proud of the fact that my dad was a, a good athlete and a good man and uh, he loved wayne county and, and goldsboro and fremont 
as much as life itself. And Marty, thank you. That was perfect. Um, and just when you get a chance, we, uh, Mr. Peacock let us borrow, the library borrow, a really, really beautiful scrapbook that was kept by, uh, for his father during his college uh, and a minor league playing career in the beginning of the Boston Red Sox. We got digitized. Um, University of North Carolina did it for free for, for the library. And you can uh, look at it uh, through the library webpage. It's this linked up. And there's a lot of great photographs. Um, there's even a handwritten uh, contract from the Boston Red Sox in 1936 for his father. Um, so. John Peacock for to speak on behalf of Mikey. Thank you, Marty. I, I too want to echo what Jack said about uh, Marty. When I first, uh, several months ago, someone asked me to, if I had met the guy at the library that was putting something together <laughs> on baseball. And I said, uh, no, I really haven't. And they said, oh, you need to go by there and meet him. And, um, and I just kind of put it off and put it off. And then one day Donna called me and said, you need to come down here and meet this guy. And uh, I've been blown away, as I know all of you have. Um, this is something you really need to tell your family and friends about, what we have here. And uh, Marty, as, as Jack mentioned, uh, Marty's told me stuff about Clyde that I had no clue about. Um, but it's interesting. I've, I've been hanging around the family for the last 40 years now. And, and um, I'm probably the worst person really to speak on this because I don't read the sports page um, <laughs> except in October, late September and October, if uh, Clyde was involved in it. But um, I, I, I really want to talk about maybe what, what I would have to say is the rest of the story. Uh, aside that, you know, everybody knows about the facts and the figures. Um, Clyde was in baseball from 1944 until he died. In 2011, he was on the Yankee payroll until uh, 2010. Excuse me, um, until he died, he was on the Yankee payroll, and uh, it's a long, long time for somebody to be involved in professional baseball that long. And manage the number of teams he did, and manage have the opportunity to manage both Willie Mays uh, and Hank Aaron. Um, it's almost unprecedented. Um, but Clyde would, would I think want you to hear about sort of what led up to that. Um, you know, everybody uh, knows big league numbers, but when Clyde was 15 years old, he was pitching for the board manufacturing team, which is a group of grown men. Uh, many of them had come out of a uh, minor league system and were playing in manufacturing leagues. And some of these guys from their 20s, 30s, and 40 years old. Um, Clyde always loved to tell a story about playing in Kenley one time, and as a 15-year-old, he is uh, pitching against a 40-year-old, 40 40-something-year-old 40 man by the name of Harvey Pittman. And um, at that, that point in time in, in, in that league, they only had um, one umpire, and he stood behind the pitcher. And this one time, Harvey Pittman comes up to bat and, and um, hit a line drive right down the third base line. And so the, the, the umpire, of course, leaves where his, he's standing runs over to the third base line and is watching intently to make sure to see if the ball goes fair or foul. While he's watching, Clyde hears right across the pitcher's mound. Here comes Harvey Pittman from home plate, across the pitcher's mound, straight to second base. And everybody's screaming and yelling, but he just, he didn't tag first. He didn't, and the umpire turned around and said, I didn't see it. And uh, <laughs> so that taught him a lot about how some of these guys played back then at that level. Um, Clyde, I think, would also tell you that uh, some of the most significant people in his life uh, were right over at Goldsboro High School. Uh, C.W. Twyford and Janie Ipock. Janie Ipock's the one that, when he was doing poorly in math, kept him after school to tutor him so that uh, his grades wouldn't drop. If your grades dropped was below a certain level, you couldn't play. And uh, he gave her credit every time he ever spoke um, for really being one who got him through high school so that he could go to college. Um, out of seven children in his family, he's the only one that went to college. Um, they lived uh, in his high, during his, his uh, from birth to probably 12th grade, 
they probably lived in about five different houses, from Brown Rig Street to William Street to George Street. I think they lived in three different houses in the same block on George Street. Uh, they moved around quite a bit. His dad was the only breadwinner in the family of seven, seven kids, he paid $25 a week. Uh, none of them went to college. Um, Clyde had an opportunity to go to, to college and, and didn't think he was, he was good enough to go. But he got a scholarship, excuse me, he, went, he got some money to go to uh, Chapel Hill. His first night uh, he spent on a, on a, he was to, to be assigned to a, a bunk bed in steel dormitory and there was no room for him that first night. So he stayed on a park bench uh, in front of steel dormitory that night. Um, that w started probably what was a, a, a short period of, of sheer discouragement uh, for a young man. Um, in October, he had been at school now for a number of weeks. In October of that year, it's 1942. So if you will, sort of go back in your mind. It's, it's October of 1942. Here's a, here's a young 18-year-old who um, is, at, is in college. He is trying to save some money, so he's working pre-flight program, which is the Navy pre-flight program at Chapel Hill, serving breakfast there in the morning and serving dinner um, and at, a, at a fraternity house that night. Then in the meantime, he's supposed to be doing his lessons and he's supposed to be going to either baseball practice or basketball practice. And he's worn out. Uh, he has no scholarship whatsoever. He give, he, he's, he's tired and, and he is um, questioning, what in the world am I doing here? He knows if he goes home that he's going to be welcomed with open arms. Uh, there are six other children at home. Um, there's probably um, a job in town that he can get and begin, begin helping his dad put food on the table. Um, and all of this is going through his mind. What am I doing here? I'm not good enough to be here. And he decides one, one week that he's going to quit. So he, on a Saturday morning in October of 1942, he packed up uh, his belongings in a duffel bag and he walked out and stood in front of Will and Jim and put his thumb out. Now, I didn't live in 1942, but I know in the late 50s and early 60s, if you want to ride somewhere, you stuck your thumb out and typically within a matter of minutes, somebody would come by and pick you up. <coughs> well, Clyde said car after car after car passed him. Nobody stopped. And finally, a car pulled up to the curb, and when he leaned down to look inside to see who it was, it was his freshman basketball coach, Coach Al Mathis. And Coach Mathis said, Clyde, he said, uh, he said where are you going? And, um, and Clyde said, well, he said, I'm going hunting. And um, Coach Mathis said, um, well, you know, the rule here is, as a freshman, you can't go home during the first week, six weeks. And Clyde said, well, Coach, you don't understand. I'm not coming back. He said, Clyde, get in the car. Clyde found out later that Coach Mathis was heading to the golf course uh, to meet uh, three or four other guys and play that Saturday morning. Clyde said they rode around for about an hour. And during that time, Coach Mathis convinced him to go back to his room and, and tough it out a little bit longer. Um, and he did. He walked back to Steel Dormitory and several weeks later, he never really found out how or from whom, but several weeks later he was able to get some money uh, that, that enabled him to quit his job serving meals and devote more of his time to um, baseball, basketball, and his studies. Now, all of us probably can look back on our life and see some crossroads. And Clyde said that was probably one of the four or five most significant days in his life that he never really thought about until later. Because had he gone home, had anybody else picked him up, he would have come back to Goldsboro and he'd have gotten a job and he'd have been a productive citizen and probably involved with all these different clubs and civic groups and been successful in business and so forth. But because this one guy stopped and picked him up and encouraged him to stay, 
he went on from there to then be drafted to play with the Brooklyn Dodgers and 60 some years later. Well, that's not the rest of the story entirely because about 50 years after that, sometime in the 90s now, Clyde is appearing on uh, Dr. William Friday's television program. And he tells this story. It's the first time I'd heard it. Janet, I don't know if it may have been the first time you'd heard it too. And uh, he told the story as a very pivotal, pivotal moment in his life. And um, at the end of the interview, this young man comes up to him and he said, um, Mr. King, he said, I'm, I was the cameraman back here, and uh, he said, I just want to tell you, I enjoyed that story you told and about um, Coach Al Mathis. He said, I want you to know, Coach Mathis is my uncle. And Clyde said, well, that's great. He said, you know, I hadn't seen him in, dang, 40-some years, and how's he doing? He said, he's not doing well at all. Uh, his health is declining. He's living down in Florida. And Clyde said, well, just, you know, tell him how much I thought of him and tell him hello and give him my regards and so on and so forth. And that was it. Until about two weeks later, on a Sunday night, Clyde gets a phone call. And it says, uh, is this Clyde King? Well, it turned out it was Coach Mathis on the phone. And his wife got on, took the phone from him, and she said, Mr. King, she said, uh, our nephew shared with, with us the videotape of the interview. And, and Al never realized the turning point that he had in your life and, and what a difference he made. And uh, he said, but I've got to tell you, Mr. She said, I've got to tell you, Mr. King, that when our nephew shared the tape with him, his, his whole outlook on life changed. And he just he started taking his medicines again and this, that, and the other. So she said, you know, you had an impact on him and you were a, you were he was there for you fifty years ago and now you've been there for him fifty years later. So it was those type of things that, that Clyde looked back on and said, What am I doing here? Many times we'd ride around and he'd say, Johnny, you know, I just look around and go, what, how come a guy like me? was able to do all the things that I've done, meet presidents and go to Japan and this, that, and the other. Uh, he never took any of that for granted. Um, he always was um, very lighthearted about it, and some of the things up here I, uh, uh, really don't represent all of his life, but his, his old cleats that he wore in one, in one season, I think he told me he wore those in the 50s. Um, his name played when he was manager of the Yankees for, I think, 66 games. Um, that was the season they had three managers. Mr. Steinbrenner, in his wisdom, um, had uh, Gene Michael, Bob Lemon, and then Clyde finished the season. And then Clyde was replaced by Billy Martin. And I don't know which time that was. For Martin, <laughs> but, um, I think it was the third. <laughs> <Maybe it's there. laughs> um, but it was a wonderful life for him. He loved Goldsboro. He wouldn't have made his home anywhere else. And uh, always wanted to be part of the, the, the culture and the fabric of this community in uh, whatever role he played. And this would, he would love to be here tonight just to see the kind of effort that Marty has put into this and, and the kind of enthusiasm the community has shown for this program. So thank you very much. Take me out to the bump. Boy, that was fun. <laughs> that was very good. I'm not going to sing. No, I don't sing. <laughs> um, Wayne Executive Jetport. That was fun. It I was. I love that. And that neat. was part one. The other three parts will be coming. Just hang Just in. hold on. Just hold on. Uh, Wayne Executive Jetport is where your youngster between the age of eight through 17 will be able to fly in an airplane absolutely free of charge. That's pretty neat. Isn't that great? It is. It's fantastic. Wayne Executive Jetport is offering free airplane rides. Saturday, May 31st, to any child who's interested between the ages of 8 and 17. The parent has to be there. Okay? Mm -hmm. Of course the they has do. To be there. Are they trying to promote aviation? They are indeed. Uh, youngsters, a lot of them are interested, but they don't know what to do or how to get involved in it. And this is one way to do it. It's sponsored by the Experimental Aviation Association, Young Eagles Program. And if you have any questions, our buddy Doug Lancaster, who's the manager or director out at the airport, can answer your questions, tell you more about it. And he is at 922-5983, 922-5983.
want to remind you on June the 7th at Herman Park, the Partnership for Children Smart Start is having their annual festival. It's called the Born Learning Children's Festival. Oh, yeah. Always lots of fun. It's uh, pro providing storytelling, free train rides, activities all throughout the park, live entertainment, free refreshments, and raffle prizes. This is for young children ages birth, of course, all the way up to age five. It's, it's promoting interaction between parent and child. So if they're not born yet, they're going to have a little <laughs> problem here. You but can still they, attend. They can, they can wait until next year, okay? Oh, but it's such a fun day. It'll be from 10 until 2, June the 7th in Herman Park. That's They'll right. have lots of agencies out there that offer services yes. for children and families between those ages it's as well. A lot of medical as well. Exactly. Uh, pediatricians will be there. Oh, Mental yes. Health Association will be there. Oh, yes. A bunch oh, yes. of people. Lots and that lots of information. That is a great event. It's great big. They have a big turnout every year, mm -hmm. and they give lots of prizes away. I mean, it's surprising and it's all for young children. Last year, I believe they gave out a great big, huge play ha playhouse for backyards. Really? Oh, yeah. I oh. mean, everything is really high scale with the partnership. Okay, well, yeah. Yeah, they do a yeah. fantastic they job. They do a fantastic job. Okay. Anything else happening? Oh, all kinds of stuff. I know, the list goes on and on, it but you know what, Wayne? It may be time for us to head on out for the day. Oh, we gotta go? We gotta go. Uh, me oh my oh, we gotta go oh, <laughs> okay oh, here we go oh. <laughs> all right, we'll be back again uh, Wednesday morning. We'll be right here, that's tomorrow. So join us at that time for this time here on Wherever We Are, which it happens to be Wayne Goldsboro Television. That's right. And until then, I'm Wayne Alley. And I'm Kim Best, and this is what's happening in your community.